Welcome to the Dark Goddess where we celebrate the women who dared to live differently. this photograph from 1910. What do you see? Do you see a boy and a girl? Lovers, perhaps? Well, you've probably already figured it out by the title of this particular episode of The Zigfield Follies. It's the Transistor Sisters. It's <laughs> sisters Florence Tempest and Miriam Sunshine, better known as Tempest and Sunshine. And they were a sensation at the turn of the 1900s. They really were. Sister Tempest was a transvestite, a cross-dresser, a boy impersonator. And Sister Sunshine was a girly girl who loved music, comedy, and getting high. <sighs> they performed on stage as a romantic couple. Now this is really interesting because in some of the towns where they performed, at the turn of the century in the 1900s, cross-dressing was illegal, including, believe it or not, in San Francisco. But they got away with it. And I think maybe one of the reasons is because everybody just loved them. You, you couldn't help but love uh, Tempest and Sunshine, as their little troupe was called. They were pleasant, warm, friendly, personable. And the routine that they did was PG. It wasn't a uh, body R-rated vaudeville kind of thing. It was uh, PG, uh, sort of like uh, Robin Williams in uh, Mrs. Doubtfire. Remember that movie? Yeah, it's a family movie. And he cross-dresses. So it was that kind of a PG. But it was a very subversive PG. They were really pushing a cultural bound that uh, would eventually uh, bring about, or in part anyways, the pansy craze in the 1930s. Yep, when so many gay performers got on stage and cross-dressed. Anyway, also I, uh, pushing the boundary later, uh, Sunshine would introduce Cuban culture and Cuban music to the USA. And that would give a launch to, oh my gosh, well, so much, including I Love Lucy. Oh, we got this incredible show for you today. I, I'm just uh, itching to get with it. If I could, let me just say this about them. Today, if you see a drag show or enjoy live stand-up variety shows, or if you're a woman and you wear pants, if you do the mamba and enjoy pop Latin music, well, or how about, uh, have you ever heard uh, Ella Fitzgerald sing, uh, When I Get Low, I Get High? Classic, classic, classic. Well, if you do, you have Tempest and Sunshine in part to thank. The sisters were tremendously talented. They could act, sing, dance, and even write songs. They had been on the stage from early childhood, and they were so good that Florenz Ziegfeld brought them into the 1907 Follies show, signing Florenz Tempest to a three-year contract. At that time, she was just 16. Miriam was a mere 13, and June was 18 years old. When I started this series of the women of the Ziegfeld Follies, I thought that I would start with the very first 1907 Follies and then work through to the end when they ended in 1931. I did have hesitations starting in the 1900s, I must say. I really thought that the women of the pre-1920s era would not be as exciting as those 
in the flapper era. Boy, was I wrong. The relationship of the Follies continued at various times throughout the years. In 1922, Sunshine became romantically involved with a Cuban businessman who she met while working for Ziegfeld. It was a marriage to last till death do us part, and it had a profound effect on pop culture. They introduced rumba and the Cuban culture to the world. It was huge. She became known as the Mamba Lady. Tempest had conceived of her cross-dressing all by herself. From the start of her career, with her two sisters, June and Marion, she would play the boy parts. You see, they did have a brother, but he wasn't interested in acting. Tempest would therefore fill in. Despite being a boy imitator, she was considered the prettiest girl in vaudeville. She went on to marry two very influential men. Interestingly, she spent less than two months with her first husband, Joseph E. Shaw, a principal vaudeville entertainer, during their four-year marriage. Oh, man, that's something, huh? Two months out of four years. Wow. Her second husband, Homer Dickinson, was an acclaimed vaudeville performer. She spent every available moment she had with him, forming a traveling comedian team, much like George Burns and Gracie Allen. Obviously, their theatrical names, Tempest and Sunshine, were not their birth names. Florence once explained, Our family name is I. James. I am Florence I. James, and my sister is Miriam I. James. We were born in Louisville, and it seems to me that we just hung around the Avenue Theater there at matinees from our earliest school days. We made our bow to the public at a church festival. I muffed my lines, and Marion broke out laughing at me. I gave her a furious calling down on that little stage. And after the affair was over, the kind old pastor said, Girls, if you ever get on the stage, I suggest you call yourselves Tempest and Sunshine, for you are exactly that. And when we had our first engagement in the two little waifs, we became Florence Tempest and Marion Sunshine. I've always played the boy while Marion played my sweetheart. So, there you go. That's how they got their names, and based on their temperaments, really. Tempest and Sunshine. Now, there were three sisters, of course. June I. James was born in 1888, the oldest of the three. And uh, she kick-started their careers in show business, but um, her showbiz professional life was pretty short-lived. Florence Tempest was born Claire Lillian I. James in 1891. She had an ever-changing name in articles and news reports, etc. Her sister, June, called her Clara Lee. Early newspapers often referred to her as just simply Lee. After 1903, she abandoned her birth name and used a gender-neutral name, Florence, which worked very well with her cross-dressing act. Working with her sister, Marion, she was Florence. When doing her solo act, she was Florenz, sometimes Florence without an E. Claire was not a great name for a cross-dressing act. Her two younger sisters often referred to her as simply Tempest because she was temperamental. It actually landed her in jail a time or two. Consistently in this review, I'm calling her Florence and Tempest. Those are her preferred names. The third sister was Miriam Sunshine. She was born Miriam Tungstall I. James. 
and that was in 1894. Though her sister June called her tongue stole, she used the name Miriam Sunshine constantly throughout her entire career. However, in her post-career days, she preferred her married name, Mary Azpiazu. The brother was a military man. He was not a performer. He was stationed at Fort Dix, serving in World War I. When their father unfortunately died, the three I. James girls were confronted with the stern necessity of having to earn their livelihood, and they were all so very young when he died. The stage, which they loved, seemed to be the best income opportunity. The eldest sister, June, took it upon herself at the age of 14 to become a show producer. She helped to support her whole family through productions that they would put on. She had seen where others had used the theater for fundraising, and she thought this was perfect to raise the kind of money that her parents needed. She wanted so badly to support her mom and her sisters, especially in their singing and piano lessons. After many self-produced shows, they came to the attention of Lincoln J. Carter, and he gave them their professional debut in 1905. Audience loved the trio. The sisters found themselves traveling by train in bookings all over the country, and their mother came along as chaperone. They were really quite young. The three of them were known as Tempest and Sunshine, and their fame kept growing. And this led to overseas engagements like London, England, where Marie fell ill. You know, traveling here and there, you do pick up a bug or two. And then Tempest filled in for her. The audience never knew it. They did look similar but it also speaks to how talented they both were. Returning to the U.S., Florence Ziegfeld got Florence Tempest to sign a three-year contract for his upcoming Broadway shows. All three sisters performed in the roadshow version of The Follies 1907. The Follies of 1907 was the first Ziegfeld Follies ever. It was intended to be a summer-only event, but with the contracted popular entertainers and the chorus line of the Anne Held Girls, the patrons came by the thousands. The public loved it, and Ziegfeld had a hit on his hands. Ziegfeld knew he had to take the show on the road to theaters across the U.S. and Canada. This required signing additional acts to keep it fresh, and Tempest and Sunshine Trio became part of the Ziegfeld Follies 1907, which extended into 1908. In Philadelphia, when the Ziegfeld Follies Roadshow played, Florence Tempest was featured as one of Philadelphia's favorite. She was prominently billed in Washington, D.C. In Chicago, a news report said Tempest was possessed with a distinction of being the youngest actress on the stage to enjoy being featured on the bill. The public response was so astronomical that the Follies became a standard attraction on Broadway for the next quarter century. As the 1907 Follies was in full swing, the debut announcement came of an extravagant Little Nemo show for an unheard of budget of 100 thousand dollars. Extravagant because today that would be worth two million seven hundred thousand seven hundred dollars. With rave reviews it played to sold-out houses in New York. Harry B. Smith who had helped Ziegfeld with the Follies of 1907 wrote the music for Little Nemo and knew both Tempest and Sunshine and made sure they had parts. It was a major Broadway hit. Who is Little Nemo, you might ask? Well, Little Nemo is a fictitious character created by American cartoonist, animator, and genius, and I do mean genius, Winsor McKay, Little Nemo in Slumberland. 
was a full-page weekly cartoon strip depicting Nemo having fanciful dreams when they suddenly ended when he awoke in the final panel. Wikipedia says, The strip is considered McKay's masterpiece for experiments in the form of cartoon pages. The show went on the road to two incredible seasons, and it just added to the girl's already amazing resume. With the success of Little Nemo and the Follies, the girls were gold. The girls were on the road again, doing various shows up and down the United States and in Canada. All the theaters were open to them, no matter where they went. They were famous and in demand. It was during this eventful and very successful time that their mother's brother, their uncle, James J. Hennessy, died and left the family with a fabulous inheritance of $80,000. That's a lot of money, but especially then, because in today's dollar, that would be $2 million. The money gave them a sense of stability and security that they had never experienced before. Remember, they came out of near poverty. Sister June I. James decided to go so low. Money does that sometimes. And she departed the sisters for an opportunity in vaudeville on the West Coast. Her career hopes don't seem to have panned out, and she ended up marrying Jerome Rosenberg, manager of the Casino Theater in Osbury Park in New Jersey. Over the next few years, Tempest and Sunshine had a great success on the vaudeville circuit, together and independently. Independently? Yes, as one newspaper put it, Tempest and Sunshine had an unsisterly quarrel and have parted. <laughs> they had an on-again, off-again relationship. People often think that Hollywood movies have always been full-length feature films like they are today. But in the early days, movies were usually short films. In 1915, Tempest and Sunshine became true Hollywood pioneers in a short film called Tempest and Sunshine. The film was the only film that Tempest did. Sunshine, independent of Tempest, went on to make 26 more Hollywood movies. She worked with some of the most notable stars of all time, including D.W. Griffith, Max Sennett, Mary Pickford, Florence Lawrence, Harry Carey, Mabel Normand, Jack Pickford, Mabel Sweet, and the legendary Dorothy Gish. She was active in film for eight years, 1908 to 1916. Now, let's talk about Tempest. In 1915, Florence Tempest connected up with famed vaudeville producer Joseph E. Shaw and married him. The union was perhaps a great career opportunity for her, but it was not a great marriage decision. Whatever romance there was, it disappeared in less than two months after the wedding. That's when they parted company. Tempest would file for divorce five years later on the grounds of desertion. We have one last item on June, the eldest sister. During her marriage with her husband, Jeremy Rosenberg, they helped African Americans obtain the first black-owned theater in New York. And they put on a show there called The Dark Town Follies. It was really pretty cool, you know, because characteristically, whites did not help blacks in such business matters at that time. America was pretty racist. So in spite of all of that, this was pretty cool, man. But in spite of such noble business dealings, the marriage didn't work out. In the summer of 1916, they divorced. She was awarded $20 a week alimony. 
Today, that would be equivalent to $1,732 monthly. She was just 28 at the time. And of the rest of her life, nothing more is known. Fortuitously, on Friday the 13th, May of 1921, the entertainment magazine Variety reported that Tempest filed a voluntary petition for bankruptcy in federal district court. Her liabilities totaled $5,224 with no assets. Adjusted for U.S. inflation, that would be $120,704 in today's money. It was not the best year for Tempest. Uh-uh. And true to her name, on Saturday, October 1st, she was arrested for disorderly conduct at the Hotel Radisson in Minnesota at 5 a.m. in the morning. Taken to police headquarters, the desk sergeant asked her what her name was. She said, better let me write it. It's hard to say. She then wrote the unique name of Tapes I. James on the police blotter. She was released on $25 cash bail and then was later fined another $25 by the judge. She had been a headliner at the Orpheum Theater the previous week. Trivia. Bob Dylan's brother once owned that particular theater. That same year, Sunshine, perhaps to bring sisterly support, rejoined Tempest for a grand show at the BF Theater in Washington, D.C. Tempest and Sunshine didn't always get along. They had carved out two different paths. But in this difficult year for Tempest, Sunshine was there for her. A year later, things changed again for Tempest, and this time for the good. Tempest teamed up with Homer Dickerson, performing comedy routines. It was a successful match. They worked together and eventually got married. Tempest and Homer Dickerson were together for the rest of their careers. We need to talk about the pansy craze. Tempest's influence on the pansy craze has long been overlooked by historians, and it's time she got credit, the credit that she is due. She was one of the earliest embodiments of it. The pansy craze mostly occurred between 1930 to the end of Prohibition in 1933, a short time to be sure. In the Prohibition days of the late 1920s, saloons discovered commercial success by featuring drag queens and kings because they drew patrons. They didn't have booze, so, you know, put on a drag show. <laughs> and suddenly, the gay subculture went mainstream and was featured on stages of Manhattan winning public acclaim. Tempest had been a drag king, that is, a girl impersonating a boy, since 1905. She had spent a full quarter century in Broadway houses all across the U.S. and Canada, paving the way for the pansy craze. People and critics loved her. Paradoxically, as the pansy craze waned with the end of Prohibition in 1933, so did the showbiz career of Tempest. When nightclubs could serve booze again, the broader public showed up. Drag queens were no longer needed for a draw. And as a matter of fact, many of the new customers who were now coming to the saloons felt uncomfortable with such performances. In some instances, police were stationed at the entrances of former pansy nightlife hotspots to ensure that impersonators were banned. They couldn't even get in the doors anymore. To make matters worse, there was the Hayes Code, the censorship code that went into full effect in 1933, and it banned public performances of gay characters. It was a new era. The last newspaper mention we have of Florence Tempest was in 1934, when a syndicated columnist wrote, 
Tempest lives only a few blocks from my New York apartment. I see her once in a while walking her dog. Retaining much of her charm that captured the gallery gods of another day. And so it was, the once popular Florence Tempest faded from public memory. Murian, on the other hand, went on to find new fame. Murian, continuing to perform throughout the 1920s, mostly by doing her solo act, it was during this final decade of headlining that she fell in love with the love of her life. In 1922, while performing with the Ziegfeld Folly, Murian fell in love with a Cuban businessman, and in 1930, she married him. His brother, Augusto Angel Asbiazu, a.k.a. Don Aspiazu, was a prominent band leader in Havana. And it was with him that Murian translated the Peanut Vendors song, which became the first Latin million-selling single. The story behind that million seller is one that speaks loudly about her creative spirit. The Great Wall Street Crash of 1929 ended the flapper era and the world that Miriam knew. It was all gone, and so was the money of her fiancé. He lost it all. Miriam did not despair. She married him anyways. While on their honeymoon in Havana, Cuba, UC Bio took Miriam to see his brother and his orchestra. Miriam was taken by one of the numbers they played, and she translated it into English, the peanut seller. She thought this should be introduced to a larger audience. After translating it into English, she approached the New York Palace and procured a booking. A bit of trivia, one of the venue's partners was Joseph Kennedy, the uh, father of U.S. President John F. Kennedy. Be that as it may, when the curtain rose and the Cuban musicians appeared in their Cuban dress and instruments, the audience was hooked. The mumba craze was officially launched in America. She was named the Mumba Lady. Miriam went on to write many more Latin popular selling songs. Now, here's her legacy. Today, if you see a drag show or enjoy live stand-up variety shows, or if you're a woman and you wear pants, if you do the mamba and enjoy pop Latin music, well, or how about, uh, have you ever heard uh, Ella Fitzgerald sing, uh, When I Get Low, I Get High? Classic, classic, classic. Well, if you do, you have Tempest and Sunshine in part to thank. And now you know things most people don't. This has been The Dark Goddess, where we feature women who pushed the edge and lived differently.